Okay. So now we uh, come to the third speaker of this session, Dr. Arvind Kumar. So uh, Professor Arvind Kumar, he is a PhD from Theory Group TIFR in 1969. Uh, he's a well-known educationist. He uh, joined uh, Homi Bhabha Science Center and uh, after a few years became the center director. Uh, and he was the director during the period 1994 to 2008. For his contributions in the field of science education, he was awarded the Padma Shri in 2010. He's a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences India and is the recipient of several other honors and awards, including the TWAS Regional uh, Award for Science Education. So, Sir Arvind Kumar. Yeah. Only this is this point. Thank you, Professor Shobhana, and uh, I'll be giving an overview of science education work at LVCSC. In fact, the amount of material that I have is very substantial, so uh, I'll have to rush through. There is a large number of slides and I would have to rush through, but if you have any questions, I think we, we can discuss those during tea time. So let me begin. So probably some of you may not know, I mean, most of the audience would know, the origins of LVCAC, they started with some informal educational interventions by TIFR scientists. Then it started as a unit at under TIFR in 1974, became a regular unit of TIFR from 1981, and it operated from a municipal school at uh, near Grand Road for 18 years before it get, came to this present campus. And then there was a rapid expansion of its pro profile. A small ho hostel building came up, an Olympiad block, NIUS. This some undergraduate level program started from 2002. There was a major expansion in infrastructure. And in the important milestone was the establishment of graduate school in science education as part of TIFR of university. So with that HBCAC became, it was always a unit of TIFR, but it was institutionally kind of integrally linked with TIFR in terms of, it was like on par with other national centers. This is the campus, new campus, the new NIOs building, the lawns and so on. So what's the scope of this center? The scope is science and mathematics education from primary through secondary, higher secondary to the senior undergraduate stage. And these twin objectives of equity and excellence, they shape our work profile. Now, equity and excellence, we don't mean that equity is at the lower state and excellence. We don't mean that. These are not opposite ends of excellence or anything of that kind. There are two opposite, uh, there are two complementary aspects of the same goal, that is quality education for all. So you can have excellence at the lower stage and also equity at the higher stage of education. 
So there is no such distinction between stages. Equity and excellence are not with respect to stages, but there are two aspects. Equity is for universalization of science education. Excellence, one of its dimension is subject excellence, but there are many other dimensions of subject excellence. Excellence. <coughs> There are four, uh, six uh, dimensions of work, as you see, uh, research in science and mathematics education. There are co-curricular materials. There is a very important project, Vigyan Pratibha project, project that has come up recently. The Olympiads, NIUS, and various other collaboration with other agency. Graduate school at NVCAC, it operates as part of TIFR through a in independent subject board. It's a very large number of areas with many perspectives as we shall see. There are courses in cognitive science, learning theories, history and philosophy of science, etc. And also overviews of science disciplines. And one important point is there is a compulsory field work as, as part of the graduate school, I mean PhD requirements. Now, broad types of research at NVCSC, we have science and mathematics education research in the cognitive and sociocultural perspectives and discipline-centered science. You'll get to know as I go along what all this means, but the first part is usually at school level and the second part is usually at the college and university level, but there are several studies which cut across these levels. So it began with very uh, extensive field experience in grassroots projects. And these are some of the names of the projects. And this early focus on grassroots work has continued to influence several research, PA, you know, PhDs in TI forever since. So some simple uh, remedial measures, almost common sense measures, were for these early projects for language simplification, active learning and respect for student conceptions. And we found that they result in gains and, and the most important thing is it reduces the gap between high and low performance. Now, I don't want to go through all these. They're almost common sense measures that any good teacher can, can anticipate um, himself or herself, but, but uh, they're not they're not implemented often. So we implemented them and found gains. These are the some rural school. Now, student conception studies is a very important backbone of science education research. And uh, the center actually pioneered this alternative conceptions. Now, what are alternative conceptions? They are actually incorrect in science, but they are universal, very robust, and in some cases actually have parallels with scientists' conceptions. And a very notable work was done on ch children's conception uh, with a well-known group at University of Leeds. There were other learning barriers and remedial measures in chemical equations. And also more recently, there was a very interactive teaching sessions through sessions over a year or two. We got to know some insights on the middle school student you know, alternative conceptions and what is the sequence of concepts that one should teach at the middle school level. Now, the more, you know, professional science education research, uh, visual spatial reasoning is a very important area. As we all know, science often involves visual and spatial reasoning, besides, of course, conceptual and mathematical reasons. And this is basic to creativity of many great scientists even no less than people like Einstein and Feynman and so on, they have attested to this fact that their original creative process uh, need, you know, they used to have visual, visual spatial thinking. Of course, their later products are highly theoretical and they are not perceptual, but the discovery process is visual spatial quite often, not always, but quite often. And therefore, a number of significant research studies were done in astronomy, human, physiology, DNA, etc. And the center got recognition. He was invited to, the member was invited to be the guest editor of a special issue on this topic. 
in a very prestigious International Journal of Science Education. A similar thing, in analyzing graphicacy, graphs, figures, tables, etc. as we all know, they encode scientific information. And it's again a very important part of science education research to how to code, code this information and how to decode them. And there was studies in these regards. Design and technologies and altogether is a very novel dimension of science learning. As we all know, technology permeates every aspect of human culture. And what happens, science, it's not that science can immediately give you a solution. It offers many solutions. So something else is needed other than science. And a very creative choice is needed to combine various elements to design a solution appropriate to the local context and taking into account the marginalized groups, etc. So this is an entirely new culture. In fact, many people believe this is a new epistemological cult culture. There are two cultures, as we all know, science and humanities. But now design and technology is emerging as a, as a new third epistemological culture of humankind. So this is all very well known at the higher levels, but the innovation in NBCC was to do it at the school level. And in fact, it has now been recognized all over the world that design and technology has to be right from the beginning. And even at the primary level, books are coming up at this level. This is a DNT workshop at NBCC. Now, mathematics education. Uh, mathematics education research at NBCC curriculum development and teacher, they're all integrally. It's not that first you do research, then you do curriculum development. It's not that it's integrally connected to each other. And of course, mathematics education research, I, I must tell you is an even more professional discipline and than science education research. Science education research as a professional decision started some 50 years ago, but this is even earlier. And some of the many eminent mathematicians are involved in this. So there's a lot of global research in this topic. And this was combined with common mathematic use because in different work contexts, not just in classrooms, but in different work contexts. And of course, its, its goal is universalization of mathematics education. So these are some of the techniques. I mean, it starts with some remedial measures and then the important thing in mathematics education, you take into account the teachers also, their own beliefs and their own pedagogic content knowledge as it is called, and how the beliefs interact with these content knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So I can't explain this, it needs a lot of explanation, but this is what it is. One notable area was how to transit in five, six grade from arithmetic to algebra. And then is quite a deep topic of cognitive science and uh, as applied to mathematics education. And the real problem is the symbolic expressions for children. And symbols, they have, they have representations, they have, there are procedural aspect of it, there are transformational aspect of it, et cetera. So all that has to be researched on. And there was one very interesting study in out of school mathematical knowledge from for very young age students. For example, some low income groups in Bihar and low income urban groups like in Dharavi, et cetera. So these insights were combined. And so what do they learn out of context? Not in the classroom, but out they, they are dropouts of them. So what do they, uh, or if they, even if they are not dropouts, they're, they're marginalized in classrooms. So they're in mathematics knowledge in their work context, that can be used to support their maths learning. And several studies have appeared in very highly regarded journals. And there has been a recognition that in I, this International Congress of Mathematics Education is a very prestigious conference of mathematics education. Uh, uh, and in, India was invited and one member of us from its panel, et cetera. And in fact, this book was produced as the first Asian resource book of research in mathematics education in India. And NVCC member was a co-editor. This is a mathematics education workshop. As you see, there are students uh, in the upper part of the slide and, 
and professional development of teachers, all of this is combined to produce materials. Now, science education has a cognitive dimension. It has also a social dimension. It's a very important dimension. And uh, first, of course, the most important thing is self-image and attitudes and aspirations and expectations. This is very low, even if the students are good, but if they're coming from certain backgrounds, their aspirations are low. They don't want to go beyond class 10. At most, the parental expectation, if they get through class 10, okay, that's fine. That's very different from the so-called privileged families where the expectations are very high. So that's one important point. There was also an interesting attitudinal survey of students. How do students view science and scientists? And very interestingly, Indians have a very positive image of science and scientists compared to say students in Scandinavia. <clears throat> they have a very uh, negative image of scientists. So these guys are come and spoil environment and so on. But in India, there's a very positive image. So it's a good feature. But uh, the same survey, of course, shows gender stereotypes, stereotypes and gender, of course, is a very important focus in many research studies. Another focus was this hegemony of English. And uh, we all know this, I don't need to explain this. And just mere knowledge of English is regarded as a, as meaning a lot of knowledge and wisdom and so on. So, uh, NVCC sort of worked on the fact that the multilingual character of our country, I mean, it's a myth, not among us, but among many people, that English is often equated to intelligence or, or wisdom and things like that. And therefore that, that stereotype has to be removed. Uh, there were two notable works in science and mathematics of the visually impaired students. So very interesting studies. You can see all these on the VCAC website. There are social scientific issues. There are issues that science alone cannot uh, handle in society. Science, of course, is an important input, but some ethical interventions on the part of the society is needed. And uh, this was done quite thoroughly in one study. And for example, the students' views on these matters are the, the very highly privileged science, but do not know the, the importance of ethical interventions in those, as reflected in, the, in how they kind of respond to issues like surrogacy and genetic determinism, etc. So our work in science, social dimension is quite well known. And it was on the gender issues in NCF, it, one member was there. This is a modern construct. It's a modern conceptual construct of the same kinds of things, identity. It is not only about gender and class, but it is also disciplinary identity. It's a very interesting issue, especially in physics education research. In the USA, it's being done at a lot of large number of universities. But people develop disciplinary identities, then they almost think they have to behave in a certain way. And of course, its negative aspect is that right at school stage, you develop a negative identity. Well, I'm not, I'm not meant for science, I'm not meant for maths, etc. So it's a very powerful determinant. Of, uh, of expectations and hence scholastic performance. So scholastic performance is not just being, you know, bright or intelligent. There are so many other factors that uh, give scholastic performance. And there was another program, health education. I won't go into it. It's a very, very interesting and in fact, very urgent program where the student, first of all, you'd understand student understanding, I mean, you try to expose student understanding of these things and then scale up your programs of intervention and so on. Environment education has been a recent work and it's again a very interesting work in which, <clears throat> see, it has been made part of curriculum by the government anyway, but that hardly promotes actually ecological sensibilities. So a recent action research study was that you go to a people who are actually doing that environmentally conscious community, be part of that. It, it is called participant observer mode. We just part of, you do the same things as they are doing. And there are methods of such analysis in sociology 
and then you come back and you see what are their motivations and actions, etc. And that you have to analyze that. And using that, then the student who did this PhD, she implemented a participatory program in school students, in urban, in urban farming, and then found out that it does, it does matter. And another study is going on waste as an issue around which this thing. So this, this I was talking about cognitive and social cultural aspect, but equally important is the other aspect, namely discipline center. So far I was not focusing on disciplines, but discipline center is a very important part of Omiwa Center's research. Some examples I'm giving them, many, many pieces of research done, I've just chosen a few. Problem-based learning in chemistry laboratory. So it's a well-known pedagogic approach. What you do is students are encouraged to solve a, not a typical textbook problem, like it is given in usual chemistry labs, but a contextual problem and with graded level, etc. They are given reading material, they are given laboratory and ask them to solve the thing, use, read and uh, try to find solution paths. They can get wrong, of course, because there are multiple solutions. And then the method is intrinsically collaborative. It's not just one person doing, but there are groups. And in the HBCC design, what happened, the bigger group was split into smaller groups. They discuss among themselves, and then the smaller groups as a whole discuss and finds a solution. Of course, teacher is always there. It provides what is known as a scaffolding. I mean, it supports, and particularly in chemistry lab, it has to make sure of uh, safety and so on. So. So there were some themes on which it was done and data collected and it does show tangible gains. So this is a paper published in journals, et cetera. This is just a slide on the dying, et cetera. Now student understanding of evolution of biology is again a discipline specific topic. How do students understand evolution? So this student, what he did was first, he did a cognitive study of the actual original work. Of course, all the biologists know all this very extremely well, extremely technically on technical point, but what is the conceptual part of the origin of species? That, that was the first trend. And then he made surveys on students' meanings on this thing. And it was found what is sort of expected, that students' causal explanations of evolution is quite flawed. They actually in, introduce teleological elements, and teleology is not there in Darwinian theory, but students can't get out of this. The reason is because students easily understand artificial selection because there is an agency. But what is the agency of natural selection? This point confuses young students, although it is, it's obvious to scientists, but this point of teleology, what is the agency of natural selection? confuses many students right up to the undergraduate stage. Do not think this is only children's confusion, but fairly advanced students also have these confusions. There's another technique called concept maps in biology, where I won't go into it, it's a bit complicated, but concept map means you ask the student to draw concepts and of a particular topic, let's say cell biology. So she will draw various things and connecting terms and the point is the connecting, the, the knowledge rise in the connections. This is one of the, one paradigm of uh, cognitive science that the, the concepts by themselves are not enough. I mean, when uh, concepts are linked to it, then that is when the meaning comes out. And therefore cert certain things were done from in school level textbooks and there was interesting connection between linking words the words used in higher text and the words used in linking text, and therefore it gives us a method. So professional biologists use very clear cut economic parsimonious words, whereas students would not use those words, linking words, etc. Now physics education research has been at a fairly advanced level right from the beginning at uh, Homi Bhava Center. And we first started with Galilean relativity. Later it was extended to different themes of Einstein's relativity. And uh, 
Actually, this area of work has not been PE or physics education research usually does not go beyond undergraduate level, but this is a bit advanced level. We in fact did some studies of general relativity, not the technical aspects of general, but some of the quality themes of general relativity and found some very interesting years. It was published in this very modern journal, physical review, uh, physical review P uh, and very few Similarly, quantum and concept in rotation. So, concept inventory is concept inventories by American Association. It's education research. So, we Representation also mean even text, text diagrams, models, even gestures are key to the embodiment of recognition. I'm sorry, I can't explain to you this very much. And even I do not know it as well as some other cognitive scientists. So, uh, but this is a new paradigm. And it was used in a new thesis where the students are able to interact with vectors and they found gains if you do this. Computational modeling, of course, everybody knows it's an important thing, but there was an important piece of work as to how to introduce this in schools and colleges in India, because you can't, you know, go full steam in computational model right in the beginning. So a kind of gradual design was introduced because this is a very important topic with the importance of interdisciplinary sciences and so on, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a, uh, there are conferences and seminars every year, two years. There are conference seminars. The research publications have shown a marked growth in the last three decades. So, NBCC graduate school students and their mentors have published in the fairly reputed international journals like Journal of Research in Science and Teaching, which is which is a very high rejection rate and so on, etc. So, in various journals, it has been because that's a condition for PhD in home as it is in TIFL. Also, discipline center science education research has- People on Zoom are not able to see us. Can, can you just give me a minute? Yeah. Because of the internet. Yeah, there's just some internet problems. Okay. So physics education research, chemistry education research, biology education research, so there are dedicated journals on these fields. For example, American Journal of Physics and the new journal physics, physical review, physics education research. There's a new journal. Uh, physical review has a monument. And similarly, there are journals in chemistry and biology, journal of biology education, chemistry education. So 
Our discipline centered research is published in these journals and the graduate school students who are doing PhD, most of them, some of them uh, have published in discipline center and some of them have published in this thing. And of course we publish in resonance, current science, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that is the most important point about HBCSEs, which is quite unique for any science education center, is that even we publish even in journals, not in science education, but actual sciences, the mainstream journals of say, physical review or something like that. And how has that come about? Partly, of course, some staff members personally do that, but it has come about due to a very important program, the NIS program, where the goal is to give practice, sort of research practice to undergraduate students. I must emphasize this is an educational program. This is not a research program. It's an educational program of, of motivating research students through research practices of professional scientists. So sometimes we use the word proto-research, but sometimes not proto, it's actual research publishable in mainstream journals. So that has been a very satisfying aspect of this program. But I want to conclude this research by saying that it is not just for research, because research at LBCSE is connected to other things, materials and this thing. So research is not for own sake, like in a proper pure research institute. Well, that is, that's just their business. But it is in every program it is linked with materials and teacher professional development or field programs and so on. This is some conference, etc. Now I'll go quick. I think I I must have how many how much time do I have? You have to give me another fifteen minutes. Yeah. So one important product has been Homi Baba Primary Science Curriculum. So all the contemporary educational uh, practices, all cognitive science, social cultural perspective, etc. It has all gone into this very nice product of Homi Baba Center. These are the books from the center. And these are not these are not approved textbooks of government of India, but they can in, they can you know they are model books which can be used even in new education policy. People can use that book. These are maths books. This is the whole set that has come about, and just some achievements from Homiwa Center. We actually, we were on the National Curriculum Framework 2005, and we in fact led the teaching of science group there. So it was done. The focus group document on teaching was, was done by HBCC with, of course, a lot of other members from HBC and outside, but the leadership was with HBCC. And we have been in state NCRT books many few years, etc. In NCRT books, physics, I must tell you that a very important innovation was done at, when it, they were developed in 1990s. Uh, more than a thousand problems of physics were designed for that purpose. And this has gone on and on from that. There have been various additions, but those problems have stayed. So uh, that's an important thing. These are the various NCRT and school. This is not only higher secondary, secondary, Maharashtra State Board, etc. It's books of that kind. The co-curricular materials, many co-curricular materials, right when you were, you were we were at the old campus. We several of these books were written by earlier members. They are excellent books, and uh, there is a portable laboratory of mathematics as well as sciences. We take it to various fields, to tribal schools, to various other schools, uh, to schools in Mumbai, to schools elsewhere, etc. Et these are the co-curricular materials. Some of them, I'm just showing a sample. There are a large number of them available in HBCC. This is our school laboratory. This is the mathematics laboratory where students are doing, mathematics teachers are being oriented to do mathematics laboratory. There are materials in Hindi because that has a larger reach. So this is the materials in Hindi. These are all co-curricular materials. Expository science, there are two very important exhibitions. Almost two years was spent by a large number of HBCC members on designing these exhibitions. These are the exhibitions, gender and science, history of science. If some of you have visited HBCAC some, some years ago, it was all there on the campus. And now it is, I'm told, being digitized. And this lower part is actually the mathematical resource, 
uh, exhibitions, you know. So it's gender, history of science, and some mathematics exhibition also. Astronomy popularization is always an indispensable component of any science popularization program. And the astronomy cell leader is the chair now of the uh, National Astronomy Education of the International Astronomy Union. So, so this is a kind of international recognition and IAU, the International Astronomy Union has selected India as one of its centers for giant joint IUP and HBCC initiatives. So this is one sky observation session, etc. I want to spend just a few minutes on this Vigyan, a very important convergence of all that has been done that I told you, a major program currently at Homeva Center started in 2017. It converges all the cognitive, disciplinary, sociocultural dimensions of the uh, center. Again, something. Okay, uh, so number of premier institutions across the country, NICER and I think Sa Institute and many others. I would not know this happened after I retired. So, uh, but I know it's a very, very, very important program. And the output is some very, very nicely uh, developed learning units. And those learning units are available for everywhere, although the the actual teaching is done only at select schools, but the learning units are universally available. Now, why is this some problem? Yeah, so these are the Vigyan uh, Pratipa learning units. This, they have all the standard dimensions and local context is built into, into them. And the implementation is through a science circle in a school and a cascade structure has been built up that those teachers come to HBCC for orientation and so on. And as I have said, it's a very important milestone in uh, around which a lot of research, materials development and field activity is going on. So I hope it goes on like that. Uh, these are some materials. This is a Vigyan Pratibha activity in some school outside at VCAC, some unit on evaporation, which is being done, a unit on shadows, very interesting. And I would, they're all available uh, and you can see them on at VCAC website. It's a very well-designed unit on shadows and how the length of the shadows differ from you know, see one, one part of the year to the other and time of the day and so on, etc. What is the point? I mean, why is it? No, no, this is not mine. Oh, this is not mine. Yeah. No, no, this is not mine. Yeah, this, this is, this, this, yeah. Yeah. Why does it happen? Uh, it's fine. Okay. Okay, finally, Olympiads, I'll be very quick because this is a very well-known program. Olympiads at higher secondary stage. Uh, though it is higher secondary, it's actually very, very advanced. It needs a uh, lot of higher level understanding, although that understanding has to be brought to the syllabus uh, given for Olympiads and so on. It's a nodal center of all these different Olympiads. And its basic aim is to promote subject excellence and of course, to bring honor to the country. And of, uh, another collateral objective is that the teachers get trained because teachers come to the program. And it's a five-stage program. I won't go into details. It impacts, it is impacting large lakhs of students. And its most important feature is that it has an experimental component, which is not ups, which is not there even in the best IIT exams and so on. So I do not think there is any examination in the country 
which which is i mean it's the highest level the best level program for for you know searching for excellence in terms of subject because it has both theory and experiment and even the theory the theoretical problems are thematic problems they are not the usual standard problem they are problems woven around them they take months to develop so there's a tremendous effort in developing those problems it's not a one day job it takes months and several scientists several distinguished scientists help us in this program mathematics volunteer again has been an even earlier activity and has been doing a great job of nurturing higher order talent and and getting problems you know there are, every country submits problems and then some of them appear in the final paper and that is a very very big achievement and it has been done quite a few times by by the cell the mathematics cells and there are other things going on there international olympiads these are huge events and hbcse has hosted a large number of them all i have given you this thing as far as our performance is concerned it's quite outstanding in many subjects sometimes good not outstanding and uh, many as i have told you many scientists are involved in it but some of the of course the main the main nodal thing has to be done by hbcc academic members uh, so that is the these are some pictures from international olympiads this is the observation ground of astronomy olympiad at gmrt grounds near pune they are assembling for the night observation session this is astronomy astrophysics this is an optical task developed at international physics olympiad 2015 it's a very brilliant task that was developed by the by the people who are involved in do you think say it's i am told it it's a kind of optical version of the discovery of dna structure so the optical version of that experiment was designed and hundreds of copies of these are needed because there must be 400 i don't know how many uh, students uh, participating in the olympiads so what do you do with those copies then they are distributed and this particular task is there at all icers nicer various iits and various colleges hundreds of colleges etc so it has a, it has a benefit of that kind also and same thing happens in chemistry when chemistry we hosted in 2001 there were a large number of copies and then those materials were distributed at the copies this india in physics at this all the five gold medalists uh, this is a chemistry olympiad student when we hosted in 2001 uh uh this experimental thing in chemistry is a, is again a very very challenging thing because the questions of safety the material the chemicals and so on are extremely important particularly in those in these subjects and and it's quite a challenging thing to organize it for hundreds of students in a program this is a chemistry olympiad team in paris recently and various people have got medals as you can see this is the bio olympiad uh, exper experimental task at these are nbcc laboratories so by then we had we had developed we, we had got the new stuff new infrastructure so we got these things etc this is one indian student at iob ibo international bio olympiad receiving gold medal etc the nius program again most of you know actually it started with some homeopathy study cycle in physics which ran for 13 years but then we made it na national in all subjects and it was greatly supported okay five minutes yeah yeah i'll try to finish and uh, i can't go into its details but its basic point is to enthuse undergraduate students to do to go to higher careers research careers in sciences etc through proto research or laboratory development and so on so lot of proto research goes on these are various areas in physics and astronomy astronomy we go even to gmrt and actually actually participate in the data analysis there etc with the students the scientists have been very kind and courteous and very helpful 
in all these matters. And, uh, and most NIU students have chosen research careers later. I'm told some of them, they are in TIFR also, I don't know. This is NIU's Astronomy Olympiad camp. This is a physics camp. Chemistry fo focuses on theoretical chemistry, interfacial chemistry, organic synthesis, et cetera, et cetera. Some of those are done by us, and some of those are done by BRC and IITs, et cetera. A similar program in NIUS in biology. This is an NIUS program in biology. NIUS, some outcomes. The outcomes is large number of students are this. Just I want to emphasize that these are not just the bright, just some selected students from Olympiads. A few of them are there in biology, but physics, uh, chemistry, and biology students, they come from college students. Uh, they come from colleges and they come often from even non-metropolitan areas. So it's not an elitist program for just some very bright students, not at all. It is it is open to many, many, many students and it's doing a great job at this. And a large number of projects are coming out and a large number of actual publications. And there are materials coming out of this NIUS programs. These are the various materials. As I told you, nothing is just alone, I mean, it's always with materials and field work. This is a very beautiful problem manual for 33rd ICHO that we hosted. And I must say for completeness that it is not only NIUS. Another group is doing a similar work in biology, a, a work of different kind. They call, call it CUBE, Collaborative Understanding of Biology. And then they are, they are doing it. I must mention it because that's an independent program of NIU, from NIUS, et cetera. We work for national and state agencies, various agencies we are working on, AES, et cetera, and various workshops we do. IGNU, we, I must say, there were very good quality materials brought out by IGNU, uh, in which we participated. And one important thing is the Vishwakosh, Marathi Vishwakosh project. It's a huge project of the government of Maharashtra and at VCC, has participated in it, et cetera, et cetera. And CEBS, of course, we participate. And more recently, we even have participated in Vigyan Vidishu program, et cetera. So that, I think, is known, well known. So I don't think, I, I cannot conclude this talk with some observations of mine. And that will, if you just give me three minutes. So let me now, I was very hurried. Now let me say a little relaxly. HBC is a unique center of the country where research, materials, field activities, student nurture, etc., are carried out often inseparably. It's also unique. No science education centers does science at both school as well as college level. You will find these at universities or you will find it at and some other places where they actually indulge in only school level activity. It's the only place where both things are done. And research in science and mathematics is now of professional class. It's, as I have told you, published. This is different from NGOs. There are now a large number of very, very commendable, work. I mean, NGOs doing very commendable work, but they are not professional institutes. So HBC is a professional institute in R&D. All the global insights of cognitive science and various other things are being put into our research. And equally important for content expertise in HBCAC, we have introduced this Olympiads and NIS programs. And I want to emphasize, this is just as important as research. Of course, even under this, some research programs and PhDs have been done under content expertise. So whereas, uh, so this is what I meant initially by equity and excellence. Equity excellence pervades both these programs, but Olympiads and NIS uh, promote the value of high content expertise. This we have introduced because sometimes science education centers lose sight of this. And they 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 do great work, but lose sight of the content expertise. Sometimes in NBCAC it has not happened. And it is partly because of the uh, uh, Olympiads. So to conclude the field of science education uh, research, uh, Sorry, I, I think just give me two minutes. Field of science and mathematics education is intellectually very important and very useful. It needs scholars with high competence. It needs scientists with kind of 
interest in education. So they should be content experts. And it, but that is not enough. It needs also scholars with deep understanding of methodologies of cognitive science, history and philosophy of science. So it's a combination of both that defines HBCC. One is not enough, neither, neither one nor two, both one and two, they are complementary and they together define HBCC and I in believe I should define HBCC. Thus, it is important that HBCC continues to forge strong academic links with premier scientific institutions. In particular, I'm saying the obvious that it is academic links for TIFR should, should be greatly cultivated. HBCC finally is the science education center of TIFR. It is, its positioning must be greatly appreciated by people who are now, who shape HBCC or in future will shape HBCC. They should remember the, the positioning of HBCC. It is a science education of TIFR dedicated to science education at all levels from primary to this thing. So its pr uh, promise can be fulfilled. This is the last slide uh, that, you know, subject content as well as pedagogy, cognitive and sociocultural issues, lower and higher stages of education. There should be no, you know, they should be thought of as complementary thing. They should not be thought of as opposite to each other. They should be thought of as complementary. And I hope center continues to and parents, I must acknowledge, uh, I'm, first of all, the names have not been given. All the photos are by HBCAC. We must remember VG Kulkarni and BM Mudgaukar, who actually guided the center in the first two decades. And I must say, as a disclaimer, that this is an informal overview of work from my own perspective. It is not an official report, anything of that kind. And whatever I said as my concluding observations are my observations. They are not, have any, nothing to do with HVCAC as an official institution. And I must have omitted a lot of work in this very hurried review. So my apologies to all people. And my thanks to all HVCAC colleagues and all well-wishers. And I thank TFR alumni, my uncle and the chairperson who, who chaired this meeting. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for delay.